How to love. The template for love is an historical creation. It is hugely beautiful and often enjoyable for a while. The romantics were brilliantly perceptive about some dimensions of emotional life and were extremely talented about expressing their hopes and longings. Many of the feelings they celebrated had existed before, but the romantics elevated them, turning them from passing fancies into serious concepts with the power to determine the course of relationships over a lifetime. We can also state at this point that romanticism has been a disaster for love. It is an intellectual and spiritual movement which has had a devastating impact on the ability of ordinary people to lead successful emotional lives. Our strongest cultural voice have, to our huge cost, given us a very unhelpful script to apply to a hugely tricky task. We have been told, among other things, that we should meet a person of extraordinary inner and outer beauty and immediately feel a special attraction to them and they to us. We should have highly satisfying sex, not only at the start, but forevermore. We should never be attracted to anyone else. We should understand one another intuitively. We don't need an education in love. We may need to train to become a pilot or a brain surgeon, but not a lover. We will pick that up along the way by following our feelings. We should have no secrets and spend constant time together. Work shouldn't get in the way. We should raise a family without any loss of sexual or emotional intensity. Our lover must be our soulmate, best friend, co-parent, co-chauffeur, accountant, household manager, and spiritual guide. Reflecting on the history of romanticism should be consoling because it suggests that quite a lot of troubles we have with relationships don't stem from our ineptitude or inadequacy or our regrettable choice of partners. Knowing this history invites another more useful idea. We were set an incredibly hard task by our culture, which when had the temerity to present it as easy it seems crucial systematically to question the assumptions of romantic view of love. Not in order to destroy love, but to save it. We need to piece together a post-romantic theory of couples. Because in order to make a relationship last, we will almost certainly have to be disloyal to the most romantic emotions that edged us into it in the first place. The idea of being post-romantic shouldn't imply cynicism, that one has abandoned the hope of relationships ever working out well. The post-romantic attitude is just as ambitious about good relationships, but it has very different sense of how hope can be honoured. We need to replace romantic template with a psychologically mature vision of love we might call classical, which encourages us a range of unfamiliar but hopefully effective attitudes, including that it is normal that love and sex do not always belong together, that discussing money early on up front in a serious way is not a betrayal of love, that realizing that we are rather flawed and our partner is too is of huge benefit to a couple in increasing the amount of tolerance and generosity in circulation. That we will never find everything in one person, nor they in us, not because of some unique incapacity, but because of the basic operations of human nature. That we need to make immense and often rather artificial sounding efforts to understand one another, because in intuition will never be enough that practicalities matter. So, for example, there is a special dignity around the topics of laundry and domestic management. Such attitudes and many more belong to the new, more hopeful future of love.